everyone. Uh, today, I'd like to present my research on the 1.2 kV embedded die half bridge PCB design and evaluation for check generator applications. I outlined the presentation as following. So, in the beginning, I will give a, a quick introduction and background um, to my research. Then, we will evaluate the embedded die PCB technology. Um, for its overshoot voltage, the junction to case thermal resistance, and compare it the common mode noise to standard DBC based power modules. And in the end, I'll give a summary and conclusion. Let me introduce the motivation to the research conducted. The Department of Energy outlined in the roadmap that by 2025, the traction inverter efficiency should increase to more than 98% while also the power density should increase to one, more than 100 kilowatts per liter. They state that uh, these goals can be achieved by shifting to uh, wide band gap devices and increasing the DC bus voltage from 400 volts to 800 volts. On the right figure I display the trend in power density over the years for traction workers currently used in automotive application. The Koenigsegg and also Hyundai in their latest versions use silicon carbide MOSFETs, especially 1.2 kV devices for their inverter design. What we propose though is if the DC bus voltage is 800 volts to use 900 volt silicon carbide MOSFETs instead of the 1.2 kV devices. Reason being is that with a reduced breakdown voltage the drift, drift layer of the die can be reduced and therefore also the RDS on, resulting then in smaller losses of 900 volts per kilowatt MOSFETs compared to a 1.2 kV device. The challenge with using 900 volts per kilowatt MOSFETs for an 800 volt DC bus application is that the maximum DC bus voltage can reach 850 volts. Thus, the maximum overshoot voltage is reduced from uh, 350 volts for 1.2 kV silicon carbide MOSFETs to 50 volts for a MOSFET with a breakdown voltage of 900 volts, resulting then in having to have either a small DIDT or very small current commutation of strain ductance. Researchers at the NC State University conducted research on how to reduce the strain ductance of the current commutation. They achieved a strain ductance of 13.1 nanohenry and 7.5 nanohenry respectively. Yet, with such small strain ductances, the overshoot voltage was always larger than 112 volts, highlighting that they have to have an even smaller strain ductance to achieve an overshoot voltage of only 50 volts. So how can we reduce the current commutation of strain ductance? First, we have to understand what parts contribute to the strain ductance. So that's to the most parts, uh, the DC link capacitor, the DC bus bar, and the intrinsic strain ductance of the power module. Um, to reduce the whole current uh, commutation of strain ductance further, we propose a highly integrated uh, inverter design. So we use a heavy copper PCB as our base. We used it then for the bus bar and also to place the silicon carbide MOSFETs or integrate the silicon carbide MOSFETs within the PCB structure. And on the left side, we have then the D-slink capacitors where we then use ceramic capacitors instead of film capacitors to reduce the strain ductance further. And then we have double-sided cooling for the high side and low side silicon carbide MOSFETs. The embedded die PCB layer stack up is depicted in the picture below. We have the silicon carbide MOSFET die, which is centered to a copper lead frame, and the copper lead frame then is placed into the core material of the PCB itself. Standard PCB manufacturing procedures are then used to create an eight layer PCB stack up, where microviewers are used to connect to the source and gate pads as well as the drain. Um, and high thermoconductive pre prepreg layers used at the top side and bottom side to electrically isolate the high voltage traces towards the heatsink. With the highly integrated 
uh, invert design, there are inherent challenges. And the first one is, of course, that we have to keep a small current commutation of strain inductance to use the 900 volt sink and carbide MOSFETs. Then we have to ensure that the current density within the diesel link capacitor region um, isn't too high, as well as providing a high thermoconductive path from the slick and carbide MOSFET towards the top and bottom side cooling, while keeping the common mode noise to a minimum. In today's presentation, I will focus on the results of the uh, switching transients, the uh, thermoconductivity, and also um, the common mode noise evaluation. This then brings me to the uh, embedded IPCB technology innovation itself. First, let me introduce to what the PCB's operating conditions are and how the PCB then looks like. Um, the inverter itself is designed to have a DC bus voltage of 800 volts. The peak power should be around 200 kilowatts. The phase RMS current is 300 ampere. The switching frequency should be above 20 kilohertz and the efficiency should be greater than 98.5%. We uh, conducted uh, MOSFET loss simulations in MATLAB and PLEX where we um, investigated at what switching frequencies the MOSFET losses would be and compared then the MOSFET losses of a 1.2 kV silicon carbide MOSFET uh, to three 900 volt silicon carbide MOSFETs. The solid lines represent um, if I parallel three dies and the dashed lines are if I parallel four dies. We see that all 900 volt silicon carbide MOSFETs have a smaller loss um, compared to the 1.2 kV device. Um, we decided in the end to parallel three devices where MOSFET D has the smallest losses of 82 watts at 20 kilohertz. So based on that, I then designed a half bridge embedded IPCB where the RMS current is 100 ampere, the MOSFET losses are assumed to be 82 watts, and instead of the 900 volt stick and carbide MOSFETs, I used the 1.2 uh, stick and carbide MOSFETs to ensure that uh, my PCBs won't break if I exceed the 900 volt drain to source voltage. The designed embedded I PCB half bridge uh, can be seen in the left. I have uh, at the top right the high current DC connectors, uh, decoupling capacitors closed. Are placed closely to the embedded die and then the AC output terminals. On the inside, located uh, below the heatsink, we have then uh, the low side and high side silicon carbide MOSFET. At the bottom of the PCB, I have then uh, the bottom side heatsink as well as the current booster stage to provide a small uh, gate loop inductance. When it comes to the internal design or trace design to reduce the uh, current commutation loop, the upper animation will show the uh, top side view of the trace design, whereas the lower uh, figure will show the cross section of the current commutation loop itself. So if we start at the bottom with the two dies, high side and low side die, I have then on the third layer the AC trace connecting the drain of the low side die to the source of the high side die. Additionally, on the uh, third layer, I have the DC plus trace connecting my decoupling capacitors to the drain of the high side die. And then on the second layer, um, I have the return path or the DC minus trace and returning from the source of the low side die back to the decoupling capacitors. Um, with that, PCB design approach, I'm able to achieve a, a PCB strain inductance in the current commutation loop of 744 picohenry, um, which allows me then hopefully to have small overshoot voltage during the turn off switching transient. The turn off overshoot voltage is then measured with a double pulse test setup where the DC bus input voltage is 855 volts, the device is turned off at the drain current of 142 ampere, and the voltage slope should be larger than 20 volts per nanosecond. As a reminder, the maximum overshoot voltage 
must not exceed 50 volts to allow me to use 900 volts taken car by the SVET. The measurement results are de uh, depicted in the left figure, where the load current was at 142 ampere, and the blue curve represents the uh, drain to source voltage of the low side die during the turn of switching transient. At a switching speed of uh, 69 volts per nanosecond, um, we would reach the maximum drain to source voltage of 904.6 volts, meaning then that if I switch at a smaller speed than uh, the 96 volts per nanosecond, I will always be within the uh, voltage margin of a 900 volts taken carbon MOSFET. This highlighting that with an embedded IPACB design, I could use an 800 volt DC bus voltage while using a 900 volt taken carbide MOSFET. This then brings me uh, to the thermal analysis of the embedded IPCB. Uh, we have the following conditions. So the maximum junction temperature of the silicon carbon MOSFET die must not exceed 150 degrees Celsius while the coolant temperature is at 70 degrees Celsius. From the uh, loss simulations, we do know that the uh, MOSFET loss is 82 watts. Um, we also assume that the uh, heatsink thermal resistance is 0 0.4 uh, Kelvin per watt, which means then that the total um, thermal resistance from junction to coolant must be smaller than 0 0.98 degrees Celsius per watt, resulting then in a junction to heatsink thermal resistance of uh, no more than 0 0.58 degrees Celsius per watt. We then analyzed the uh, junction to heatsink thermal resistance with a, a thermal analyzer setup uh, in our Arlington lab, where we follow um, the JDEC JESD um, 5114 standard to measure the adjunction to case thermal resistance. And the standard defines that the first body diode forward voltage drop is measured in correlation with the junction temperature. Then two measurements will be conducted um, where the thermal impedance is measured where silicon oil is used as the thermal interface material and then a corning thermal paste is used as the thermal interface material while we measure then the thermal impedance the second time. And the divergence point of these two curves equals the junction to case thermal resistance. The thermal impedance test setup is depicted in the left picture where uh, the embedded IPCB design is clamped into a heatsink with a constant pressure. Um, then we uh, supply current for the die heating and we will measure then the uh, body diodes forward voltage drop. Uh, two measurements are conducted, one with a silicon oil as a thermal interface material and uh, the second one with a corning thermal paste as a thermal interface material. The resulting thermal impedance curves are depicted in the right figure where the red line represents the thermal impedance while well, using silicon oil as the thermal interface material, and the blue line represents then the, cur uh, the thermal impedance if we use a, cor a corning thermal paste. Um, we have then the divergence point at 0 0.48 degrees Celsius per watt. And I conducted these measurements then for both high side low side MOSFET as well for top side and bottom side. The averaged top side thermal resistance and bottom side thermal resistance are 0 0.625 Kelvin per watt and 0 0.418 Kelvin per watt. Resulting then in a combined thermal resistance uh, for the double sided cooling from junction to heatsink of 0 0.28 uh, degrees Celsius per watt. If I would use a single-sided cooling, the thermal resistance junction to heatsink would be 0 0.475 degrees Celsius per watt, highlighting that we meet the requirement of having a thermal resistance junction to heatsink smaller than um, the required 
0.58 degrees Celsius per watt. Compared uh, to standard DBC substrate or TO247 package, we were able to reduce uh, the thermal resistance junction to heatsink by more than half. Then already to the last point of the uh, evaluation, the common mode noise comparison. Um, the IEC standard CISPR25 sets the noise limits for traction inverters. Yet, um, we currently do not have the complete traction inverter setup, so I cannot analyze the PCB based to that IEC standard. Instead, I decided to compare the embedded IPCB common mode noise to standard uh, power modules. In traction inverter applications, the common mode noise is usually introduced by the uh, capacitance between the phase output and ground, or the heatsink, as the heatsink is on the uh, vehicle's low voltage ground. There, if we compare the capacitance, the first version of the embedded IPCB has a very large uh, common mode capacitance of uh, 430 picofarad compared to um, standard power modules where the or common mode capacitance is uh, 220, 230, and 61 picofarad respectively. Um, to be able to compare uh, these values better, uh, we decided to use the figure of merit uh, where we divide the uh, common mode capacitance by the rated output current. And there we see that the first version of the embedded IPCB has a very high value compared to the standard power modules. In a later design version of the embedded IPCB, we're able to bring the figure of merit much closer to the power modules itself. We conducted sessions to compare we created a, a spy simulation of our um, traction and water setup. Well, first we uh, used then the common capacitance of 432 picofarad to get the common mode noise level for comparison. Um, next step, we then analyzed what the capacitance or the common mode noise would be uh, when the capacitance drops to 81 picofarad and 62 picofarad, where we can see um, a stark drop in noise level by almost 6 dB for the power module as for a second design version of the embedded IPCB. In addition to that, the embedded IPCB allows me to place uh, additional bypass Y capacitors very close to the switching half bridge, <coughs> effectively moving then the high noise common mode noise level peaks to lower frequencies and therefore reducing then the common mode noise, highlighting the advantages of the embedded IPCB when it comes to the common mode noise. This already brings me to the end of my presentation, the summary and The key takeaways are that the embedded IPCB outperforms um, a tier 2 for 7 package and a silicon nitride DBC substrate when it comes to the uh, junction to case thermal resistance. Additionally, the PCB technology allows for a minimum overshoot voltage of 49.6 volts under maximum load conditions. Um, in the first design version of the, uh, the embedded IPCB, the coupling capacitance is much larger compared to um, power modules with a similar power rating, yet uh, that could be mitigated for future embedded IPCB design versions.